The Myth, Legend and Lore podcast would like to introduce Scarpedon Art by Jacob Faust. As some of you will know, Jacob is the illustrator for the outstanding Saga Thing podcast. I am delighted to share with you the new Scarpedon Etsy store, where you can choose from a selection of amazing images available as prints, shirts and hoodies. As most of you will know, we are huge fans of the saga of the Volsungs over here, and I have to say I am the proud owner of the Sigmund Son of Volsung t-shirt. It's absolutely fantastic. Please check out Scarpaden Art over on Etsy, Scarpaden Art, and also on Instagram, Scarpaden Illustrator, where you can discover past and present illustrations and eagerly await the future work of Jacob and Scarpaden Art. Links will be in today's show description and over on the YouTube channel. Welcome to the Myth, Legend and Lore podcast. Today, I have the joy of welcoming two fantastic guests for this special episode, author Joshua Gillingham and narrator Alexander Stewart, who have something of an announcement that I'm sure many of you will be delighted to hear. Joshua and Alex, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Siobhan. Hello. Great to see you. Nice to meet you. And you guys too. I must say, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. But first of all, you have some news to share, and that is the release of the Gatewatch audiobook. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> coming soon, coming soon. Yeah, October yeah. 5th. Yeah, that's more like it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, October 5th, the audiobook will be released on Audible. Uh, uh, and Alex has just been working like uh, day and night here to get uh, uh, this recorded and edited. We've been back and forth throughout the summer. And um, uh, yeah, the book's been out for about a year now. Uh, I know a lot of people enjoyed the adventure, but it's going to be so cool to sort of welcome them back to the realm of Naros to experience it in like a whole new way. And I've been listening um, during the kind of the final stages of of, uh, of editing and, and 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 listening to the final tracks, and it's amazing. Every, every, I highly suggest everybody keeps an eye out on October fifth for the launch because it's going to be uh, uh, very exciting. Oh goodness, it really is. And Joshua, how did you feel when you first heard the the world of Torrent Entries being brought to life? It's this weird thing of, and Siobhan, you're an author too, so you understand that like when you write a story, at least when I, when I do, and it sounds like you're sort of similar because I, I read your work and it's got this sort of like, you know, epic uh, feel to it. it you Thank kind you. of see it cinematically sometimes, right? Like the scenes and the shots yeah. and, the, uh, and the characters, it's almost like you're watching a movie in your head and you're madly typing, they're trying to get it all down. And so um, it's a little bit unnerving. Um, to have somebody else read that and then you feel like you're listening to the narrator that you heard in your head before and you're like where did that come from that's another person that's not in my, how are you in my <laughs> head right now but uh uh that's definitely uh, uh what i felt when uh i i heard alex's audition i just oh that was it and i i, I called up crow's nest i'm like this is the guy yeah this is this is literally the voice i heard in my head and so um it's been almost like a way for me to almost rediscover the story too uh, uh and it's been a pleasure to hear alex's uh, interpretations of the voices and the characters um uh, yeah, it just kind of brings a whole new life into the story. Oh, wonderful. And Alex, when you read The Gatewatch, did you immediately have a good idea as to what each character would sound like? There's so many wonderful characters that really stand out. Does that help at all or does it make it a little bit trickier? That makes it a lot easier. It was actually, it was really good. I was looking for like a book to audition for and the Gatewatch popped up. And I've always been really into Norse myths and just like the idea of like the voices for like trolls and these troll hunters, like these heroic characters. And the fact that they were so different just straight away was just like, okay, well, I can do this voice for this person. I can try a couple voices of this. And at first I was like reading through and um, the voice for like, Grimza was like a little bit, I was like, I, I could do maybe a bit deep. But then the more I was listening and I was like learning about him, it popped out and it's like, he's like, I should be Grimza, yarn show. So this is great fun. And the rest of them is like exactly the same. And did you have a favourite character at all or perhaps more than one? That was like, that was my, my first one totally. And then I was um, looking at Bryn and I was kind of like, I, I think like the... I, just the idea of just <laughs> like a character that's like I think loosely based on Loki. So I was correct, yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, I was like, I was like, oh my god, I can do Loki. He's been my favorite character from 
like Marvel and things. And when I used to like, when I was listening to the old kind of prose Edda and things, I was like, I, I tried to insert it and like try to twist it a little bit. And it was like, one of the most fun. <laughs> That's wonderful source material, and Bryn really stands out. I think his scenes with Grimsa are fantastic. Joshua, when you released the Gatewatch, was it your hope then to someday see it in audiobook format? Yeah, and you know what? Um, even before the book was published, as I was writing it, uh, this actually goes back much further in that the Gatewatch, as uh, Alex has already mentioned, and you had as well, is sort of inspired by the Norse myths and Icelandic sagas. Um, some of those are, uh, you know, these sort of semi-historical texts about actual figures in Iceland. Some of them are um, sort of like the myth is the mythic basis for the worldview of the Vikings. And um, spoken word was actually a big inspiration for the story, and I wanted a story that would sound good out loud. I wanted a story that um, made people feel as if they were sitting in sort of a firelit hall in you know, ancient Scandinavia in the depths of winter, listening to uh, you know, a teller of tales regale them with this with the story of troll hunters and, and magic and adventure. And so right from the outset, even though I was creating a book, I wanted it to be something that would sound uh, nice out loud. For the Vikings, uh, spoken word was also really important, and we could get into this a little bit later, um, but uh, especially with uh, some of the verses and stuff, I kind of wanted to capture uh, some of the magic of that, that skaldic rhythm and meter. Um, Vikings, of course, didn't have uh, a written language. They had runes, of course. Uh, those were used, um, you know, for waypoints um, with carvings into rune stones uh, and, and sticks as archaeological artifacts, but they didn't write in the sense of you know writing down books and and keeping historical records and so the spoken word was actually really important to Vikings and it's so cool to kind of see this book come full circle you know from the story that I first imagined kind of just being spoken um, to becoming a book and then now back to uh, being the spoken tale that hopefully um, especially as we head into winter here people can imagine themselves um, in that exact position right in a Viking hall uh, feasting and and drinking and uh, enjoying this tale. Oh, absolutely! I think it's the perfect time of year for this tale and. Something else I'm I'm really looking forward to is hearing the poetry and the ballads. That may be a new experience for some of the audience who perhaps aren't familiar with that aspect of Norse culture, and it's it's a whole new way for them to appreciate it. I'm glad you said that. I I, I was chatting with my partner the other day, and we were, we were kind of laughing because I'd reread Tolkien. Um, uh, last summer, I just decided to read the trilogy again. I hadn't read it in a while, and uh, it's always always an enjoyable read. And I was telling her, "Oh, I love I love these poems." You know, I kind of just like glanced over them before, and she's like, "Oh yeah, I never read the poems. I just skip over. It, it has nothing to do with the story." And I'm like, "No, you have to read the poems. That's like such an important part of it." And uh, I do admit, a lot of the poems don't really move the story forward, but they are this like really unique aspect of storytelling. And I've had a lot of readers comment. Um, you know, they, they, I at first the even the editor was saying, "You know, there's a lot of poems in here. Like I like them. Our readers." like them there's all these riddles like is that really going to land with people or is that just going to be sort of off-putting and uh rave reviews for the riddles uh people enjoy the poetry it's, a, it's something that i think makes the book um unique and alex has done an amazing job of sort of capturing that it's kind of the force and the rhythm of uh of some of these um he a uh, little spoiler alert he even sings yeah, he's a multi-talented guy here so there's, there's there's even there's even sung verse in there too so oh that's fantastic and alex was that a part of the book that you really enjoyed the the poetry and the ballads Absolutely loved it. When it was to get to the best when it's like, oh, I can sing, I can do a song, I can like <laughs> try and show off a little bit. But <laughs> and then it's like, trying to find like a, a rope that goes. So one of my, like, my pet hates in audiobooks is when you try to like, like everything's perfect, like the narration's amazing, and then it gets to a song and it's kind of it's like that's often a little bit flat. There's some like really, really good ones that are done. Like in I think in my, uh, that audiobook with Tim Gerard Reynolds doing the songs, he actually sings and a wonderful rendition of the song in that. And I was like, Oh, I, I want to try and do that, see if I can do something almost as good and luckily for the first for the first song in it um like it was i was very very lucky that josh had actually already put some song together so he showed me it from the, the last i think that was it like the first podcast you guys did it was indeed, yeah i think you yeah. featured i think you featured the, the song of the needle on the, on the first podcast it was, it was so funny there was sort of that like overlapping and and uh, uh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. so i was like i was sitting in my podcast in my booth which i made in my house um i was just like holding like listening to a bit of the podcast and then just like try to sing <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like the, the poems are all wonderful. Just they add, they add so much flavor to the story. Like the Lay of Bioric at the end was um, like, there's a, I think the, in chapter one, or is it chapter two? We have like the first verse of it, the fifth verse. But, um, and then like I, at the end, I was going through it again and I was just like, wow, this is, it's, uh, once you go back, you can like listen to it again. It's just, it's really, uh, it hits, it hits different, as they say in some other podcasts. Oh, I agree, definitely. And, um, 
Joshua, could you tell us a little bit more about your experience of writing Old Norse poetry? It really is incredibly complex and not for the faint-hearted. Um, so my interest uh, started um, when I, I was scouring the university library at the University of Alberta, where I was. There was just kind of this dusty old shelf on the seventh floor. You had to go way, way up. You know, I think it was one of those silent floors in the university library where we weren't supposed to talk, right? So very few people ended up going up there. Um, and I, I think I cleared the dust off the whole shelf, but there was Icelandic sagas, uh, and there was a book by uh, Peter Hauberk on um, uh, Icelandic and Old Norse uh, verse. And so he kind of broke down the different forms and, and talked about what was unique about um, skaldic poetry. And uh, uh, it, it is extremely challenging. And, and even, um, you know, I've had the privilege of sort of talking to some academics today who study it. And uh, it's been described as, you know, dr draconian, uh, an extremely complex meter. And it's made even more difficult by the fact that uh, Old Norse was less phonetically diverse than English. Um, and these verse forms focus a lot on uh, syllable counts and on internal rhymes, really tight internal rhymes. Like we would think of that as alliteration. Um, and it's actually harder to write these verses in English than it is in Old Norse because uh, of that English has more sounds. Because it has more sounds, it's harder to rhyme words. Um, and the other thing is Old Norse as a language too is much more flexible. Uh, uh, in English, we have this really formal structure where the subject and the object have to be. If you swap the subject and object, funny things happen like the cat ate the mouse becomes the mouse ate the cat, which makes no sense. Um, but in Old <laughs> Norse, um, there are word endings that actually allow you to define the subject and the object no matter where they are in the sentence. So, um, uh, you know, Imagine having less sounds to work with, which is actually a good thing because there's more rhymes. Uh, and then there's no, um, or not no, but there's there's m many fewer rules uh, to do with sentence structure. In that case, uh, you know, making poetry like that became much more easy. That being said, it was it was not an easy thing to do, and a lot of the Viking skalds were not only able to create verses like this, but they could craft them on the spot. And if you were a talented skald, especially in the court of some of the Norwegian kings, um, and Icelanders in particular were famed for being uh, excellent poets, you might be rewarded quite richly and could maybe make a living um, in the king's court uh, doing that sort of thing. So uh, it's funny because, uh, you know, all, today a lot of, um, you know, uh, Viking music, as we like to think of it, is uh, uh, which I, I tend to enjoy. I like this sort of thing is like you know metal and heavy metal and this sort of thing, which is uh, uh, you know very epic and very mythic. But I, I sometimes wonder. I think if Vikings, um, based on what I know about them through their skaldic verse forms, came to live in the modern day, I think they might be much more intrigued by rap music actually, because they love this idea of you know interlinking you know words and sounds and coming up with ideas and the whole idea of like in, you know insulting your enemies or praising yourself or telling a story through these sort of intricate rhymes, um, I think would really resonate with them. So so I, I wonder, there's there's the question, would modern day Vikings like Viking metal or would they like rap music? My, I, I think they might like rap music better. Oh, I, do you know, I really like that. I think you might be onto something there, definitely. And um... Um, we've talked about bards and skalds in past episodes of the podcast, but um, I thought it might be interesting just to touch on how demanding a profession that it could have been, especially if we consider how much you had to commit to memory. Oh, for sure. And I think that... Um... Uh, it wasn't just, you know, a profession in the sense of, you know, entertainment. I mean, this is this was their history, right? So, um, you know, family histories, um, the sagas of sort of ancient heroes, um, things that were happening with kings. Um, this was a this was a big deal for kings to have skulls follow them in their courts because they needed people to compose verses that told the stories about them in the way they wanted them told, right? Um, if their enemies were making verses about them and that's what was spread around, that was the narrative that was going to survive um, in the end. So um, a, a difficult job. Uh, also, you know, balancing the the, the yeah, personalities of very powerful uh, Vikings was, I'm sure, not easy. And having to maybe switch sides when things went one way or another, there was a lot of chaos around uh, Harold Finehair's conquest of Norway uh, when he tried to unify it as, as one country. And in fact, that event led to a lot of Icelanders um, uh, people who became Icelanders leaving Norway for Iceland. Um, and that tradition, because Iceland was so geographically uh, isolated, gets preserved really nicely. So I don't know if we'd have the same appreciation um, or understanding of Old Norse verse today if the Icelanders hadn't um, gone to Iceland, actually. I think that was um, just historically and ge geographically something that ended up being really important in uh, preserving what little we have of the Norse myths and, um, and, that, and that history that was at one time only spoken. And I wonder what you both think about the role of oral tradition or lore in today's society, if it's just as important as it was in the past and, and has it adapted over time to suit the audience? I'll maybe pass this one off to Alex because, you know, as a, as a, as a, 
Uh, yeah, as 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 a writer, you know, I mean, maybe I'll, I'll pitch it this way: as a writer, you know, I'm, you know, the written word has really been the dominant form, I think, for the last five six hundred years uh, in terms of communication. And you know, we have news media; you can turn on the TV, you can see people speaking. But um, uh, yeah, Alex, maybe, I, maybe you could share your thoughts on this. But I feel like um, the spoken word through podcasts like this, through audiobooks, um, uh, has really sort of gained some maybe unprecedented ground uh, and surprising um, popularity for. For those who you know thought maybe everything was going to go digital, everything's going to go uh, you know written, um, the human voice kind of continues to be popular and is kind of making a comeback. But Alex, what, what's your uh, as a voice actor? Kind of what's your um, experience with that? Yeah, I guess we obviously we've had sci-fi books for the last like ages that I thought like even back in like it was like the sixties when they had the wireless and everyone used to gather around that and just listen to people like speaking over the radio. And they're like, oh, soon it'll just be injected into our brains and we'll just yeah. we'll just <laughs> see it on a screen. Like people won't speak anymore. But there it is. Like as, as Josh said podcasts are really taking off and then there's like audiobooks are coming back in a big way like I've got massively into audiobooks a while ago because I find you can multitask and you can like listen to something so you can have some menial task like you're just plastering a wall or something and then you have to just like and then it's like oh this is fun I want to go back out I don't want my tea break to be too long I want to go back out I want to find out what happens next to the character but I think it'll, it'll always be there and even when you're if you go camping or something you're like sitting around a campfire with your friends it's always you're telling stories of things that you've heard or things that you've seen that you've been I think it's it's a very natural part of being human and I don't think I don't think it'll ever go away I hope it doesn't and if I was to make a comparison to I think you know we all had this experience of the pandemic of you know you know being used to seeing people in person and then sort of having to uh you know meet online which is you know a, a great second option uh but honestly uh, having you know I've read this book probably 30 40 times like straight through never mind all like the little sort of like tiny edits and uh uh, you know, it it honestly feels like uh, you know reading it was uh, uh, exciting. I wanted to write a book that I would like to read, but hearing it is just a totally different experience. I would say almost as dramatic as you know meeting somebody online versus meeting somebody in person. Like like the depth. I mean, it's not just a sentence, right? It's got this like it's got this voice and it's got this texture and it's got emotion and it's got tone. And um, I know uh, I, I, I listen to Writing Excuses, which is another another great podcast. And Mary Robinette Colwalt, who's a writer, is also a, a voice actress, and she says, um, you know. Uh, you know, you can say a sentence, you know, 20 different ways and have 20 different meanings. And she, she kind of demonstrates this a few times on the podcast. And it's amazing, right? Um, I, my craft is not in spoken word. My craft is in writing. Um, so maybe for me, that just makes me appreciate it more that, uh, you know, there's this sort of mystery to it, but it does have so much more depth um, and feel. Also makes it more worrying when you're trying, like when you try to do the audio book and you're like, oh, did I say it wrong? Did I? Like, I've, I, I've got one of my one of my favorite books. I've listened to the audio book. I've listened to the the, the US version and the UK version. And yeah. like usually I'll be, I'll be like a, a purist and be like, oh, the UK version much better. But, <laughs> but the American version is like I, I can't remember. I think it was Nick Podell did the American version, and it is wonderful. I won't name the book, of course, but like the, the, like it's amazing. It's so funny. And then I, I listened to the UK version. I was like, why is this book boring? Why is why yeah. is my why is my favorite a bit boring now <laughs> yeah that's fun that's <laughs> they fun. can really bring it to life i think in, in most cases like the audiobooks are like they, they're always very very enjoyable to have if we think about the preservation of cultural knowledge and heritage do you think audio recordings are an important resource I'd say that like, it's really good for pronunciation things because I find that so many words when I'm reading, like I was always like my parents used to make fun of me when I was a kid for mispronouncing words when I was going through. I think I was uh, the word battalion. I was like battalion. It's like a battalion. battalion yeah, why not? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I was like, you fool. <laughs> <laughs> I like but that yeah, voice you have for your parents. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't sound exactly like that. It doesn't sound. Yeah. Like that. But <laughs> <laughs> it's really good to learn the proper ways to pronounce things, especially if it's like um, words from like the Icelandic, is it, or like from like Old Norse. Like I was really liked in the, in the start of Josh's book how we had like written down the pronunciation guides, so you can like find like the J is always the Y, and if it's an S K, it should be a sh sound, and I, <laughs> rather than me always going like skull if I'm like, pretending to be a Viking with my friend. It's like, no, it's shawl, shawl. But it's really good. I think, yeah, I think, I think it's important. Oh, I was going to say there's a cool connection to Canada here too, because um, you know in Canada there's uh, many different First Nations groups who have original languages, which um, again were very oral, very spoken, and have sort of um, uh, disappeared kind of through the process of colonization, or have really been restricted in terms of their use. And it's been so cool, um, especially on the West Coast here, to see linguists um, and communities working together to uh, get as many recordings as they can of elders, sort of like speaking as much of the language as possible. You know, building maps, building um, you know uh, educational resources for people 
people to uh, be able to still learn it even after um, uh, so much of that culture has been lost, you know, trying to, trying to preserve what is left of that. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've been surprised talking to academics um, in the area of Old Norse, there's not a lot of agreement on how, how it would have sounded or um, what the pronunciation would have been. There's some kind of differing um, ideas. And so, yeah, I, I kind of wish that, you know, the Vikings had little audio recorders and they could have recorded some of their verses for us. Um, and, and I do think it's a really important preservation of culture. Uh, there may be a connection, maybe, um, uh, Siobhan, you can maybe comment more on this uh, than I could, but um, I, I know at one point in time I was, uh, and I still am, which finding time is always a thing, interested in learning some uh, Gaelic or Gaelic. And I know that um, the sort of the, the I don't know, what would you call it like the resurfacing of the language mm -hmm. or, the, or, the, or the sort of reintroduction um, as, a, as a, you know, a practical speaking language. I don't know if that's um, where the process is in, in Scotland of, of that happening, but I really enjoy, uh, I think of musical artists like Julie Fallis who um, does incredible uh, uh, work in, in Gaelic, the, the, the language and the music goes together so nicely. Um, and I think it would be really, yeah, I think it would be really tragic for us to lose um, that sort of audio sort of spoken component. And I, as we move more towards digital, um, another conversation too is like, you know, sound files, our sound files keep getting compressed. Um, and you as both audio narrators probably appreciate that more than most would, but uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the quality of sound that we're getting, you know, I'm going through these tiny little earbuds right now and I can understand what you're saying, but am I really experiencing the full effect of your voice? I'm not sure. So hopefully as technology improves, yeah, we can capture more of our language, we can preserve more of our language and we can experience it in a more, I don't know, full way. Definitely. Um, I remember coming across a recording online um, that had originally been preserved on a wax phonograph cylinder. I was doing research um, and it was a Sami Yoke recorded in Sweden around 1913. No way. Um, as well as being, you know, massively culturally important and, and invaluable. The, the audio had such a charm about it. They, there was still that, that crackling that you sometimes get in old recordings going on in the background. Um, and, you know, it was just it's something to be treasured. And it was, it was such a find. It really was. I think when it comes to Gaelic, um, I, I really wish it had been taught in school when I was younger. Uh, it's such a beautiful language and it sounds great on the ear. It's also pretty difficult to learn. Um, I don't know nearly as much as I'd like to. But I hope that, that more people would be tempted to learn it. I, I would really love to see that. Um, and I, I, would, I would love uh, to spend more time learning it myself too. Yeah, it's, I've, I've tried to learn it on the apps and like, <laughs> things like, I, think I, I was like happy when I was like driving through like Loch Lomond National Park and at the end, like when you were going in, it says like Falcha and like, you're like, yes, welcome, Falcha, I know how to say that. <laughs> and there's like, there's like Chidi at the end, and it's like, it's about like T-I-O-R-I-D-H. <laughs> you're like, oh, that's, yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> It's, it's fantastic. I know one of my friends introduced me to like, there's a metal band. I, I can't remember the name of it. I'd have to look it up. But um, they, they sing entirely in Gaelic, which is it's a bit different. Like, I, like you hear the ones like singing like like Swedish and the, the, that's sort of really good for like Vikings and stuff. But like, it was the first Gaelic one I'd heard. So that made me really excited and happy. So yeah, I really hope that people keep doing that. Like <laughs> sharing their experiences and like, yeah, I hope there's a resurgence. I hope we, we get back into it. In Ireland, they do a fantastic job of teaching Gaelic from primary school through to high school, which is just brilliant. And um, I have family in Dublin and my cousins were taught Gaelic in primary school and they could probably still happily hold a conversation or certainly understand enough to know what was being said. I was surprised at at one point in time, I was looking at uh, translation rights for um, the Gatewatch, and uh, that's still kind of a continuing conversation. But uh, uh, apparently, Ireland is, is is fairly prolific in terms of translating, like you know, modern popular books into um, Irish Gaelic. Um, and this has been kind of one of the big strategies. If you know, you know, kids, you know, maybe they want to read sort of you know the Hunger Games or something like that. Uh, you know, if you can provide that experience in Gaelic, there's just another um, sort of connection you can make. But uh, I, and I've heard similar things in that. Uh, in some regions, it's it's much more widely spoken. I've also talked to Irish teachers who said, you know, trying to teach kids, it, it, it's hard sometimes, right? When kids are younger, they might not appreciate it as much. I know in Canada, the language that's taught as a second language is typically French, and most Canadians, you know, can recognize sort of we call it cereal box French, where you can kind of read what's on the cereal box, but beyond that, uh, there's not too much. So um, yeah, yeah, and just sort of celebrating that diversity. I hope that uh, we can do that. And language is one of those avenues. So. I've read a couple of articles recently that discuss the importance of audio in the classroom and uh, the role that it has in education, as well as the importance um, 
of storytelling in the development of young children. And I, I found that really interesting and wondered if you if you'd both agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, and I, I just like I, I grew up on a little farm kind of far away from people. And so I was just surrounded by books all the time. And now I'm absolutely obsessed with stories. So <laughs> if I like go with the, if I get a new video game and it's got a good story, I'm just like, right, I'm staying inside. I'm going to see this <laughs> through. We're going to play. <laughs> or if like watching like a good TV show or just like any any story medium. And if you find something good and it grips you, it's, I think that's just so important. Like I'm not like I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm a writer or anything like like I've I've tried I try to write as well and just like do little bits of stories so this is when it, when you can get gripped by your own story too like I think if they, if like teaching like when I was in, in school like I I tend to ramble quite a lot when I speak <laughs> when I was in school they used to, get, used to get set us down and get us to write something and I used to write like absolute drivel but I would be like really really happy when I was doing it and it's just like you can take it on it's like fighting like you read more you like hear more stories and you kind of like get better at things. And just, yeah, just uh, yeah, storytelling is very important to us as a species, I think. I, I was speaking to a friend um, the other day, and I, I don't have as much of an interest in sort of like ancient Greek and Roman um, history, but apparently in, in those days, it was actually, you know, today we kind of celebrate reading and literacy as kind of being, you know, the height of, uh, you know, academia. But back then, it was actually to be a narrator, uh, to be an orator, uh, was actually sort of the highest form of intelligence. So if you couldn't like give a speech and be convincing, then you weren't really considered that intelligent. Whereas, whereas today, we're really concerned, I know, because I work in the education system, like, can, can, read, can kids read books? And are they reading at the right time? And are they reading? fast enough and they're reading enough words um whereas we don't often uh focus on the uh, oration sort of element i i think this is an area of maybe some uh sensitivity for writers because as writers we kind of like to hide behind our screens and our uh, uh you know our manuscripts but uh, when doing readings it, it, it's it's been funny i um I, I give it my best. I'm, I'm not an actor by any by any sense, but I've, I've done a few readings and those have been fun. But it's really challenging. It's not it's not the same medium. And I, I've been disappointed on more than one occasion uh, seeing you know a famous author narrate their their stuff um, and books I just love, and they are just they just drone and there's no emotion and it's flat and it's like you know what you are a writer that's great. It's maybe get somebody else to to do your to your narration. Um, hopefully uh, I'll, I'll take some lessons from Alex here and and work myself up so I can do some live readings. But uh, I really enjoyed hearing his. Uh, uh, recitations, and I will definitely take some notes when I'm doing my own readings here. Happy to give tips. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, you're also a musician. How important is it for you to get that storytelling aspect into your music, into the lyrics of a song? Oh, I think it's extremely important. And actually, my writing actually started in songwriting before I started writing books. And it was a really good exercise as a writer because when you write a novel, I mean, you've got 100,000 words to tell this epic story. When you're writing a song, you've got like three minutes and like maybe 200, 250 words, right? And so you really have to distill it down. Like, what's the essence of this story? And um, obviously, song uh, has been an important, not only kind of from an entertainment perspective, but also from a memory perspective. This is just kind of, you know, basic education and psychology. If you can, if you can put something to a tune, it's so much easier to remember. And I know this is said quite often, but, you know, um, uh, you know, having some family members recently who are, um, you know, experiencing, you know, Alzheimer's and, and memory loss is amazing um, to kind of observe what ends up sticking and what ends up uh, I, you know, kind of falling by the wayside. And oftentimes it's, it's a temporal thing. So things that are more recent are harder to remember. Uh, but what's incredible, uh, and especially a lot of my family um, uh, background is uh, Lutheran. And so there's sort of a, uh, a set of, you know, Lutheran hymns and songs. And it's amazing um, how, you know, these uh, uh, individuals can, can lose their memory um, for, you know, conversational things or names or faces, but you start singing one of the songs and something just clicks in and that's that's so deeply ingrained within them. Um, it's so deeply a part of them that it just, that, that never kind of gets dislodged, right? So um, yeah, no, I think, I think it goes beyond even just a practical level. I think it's like a very deeply human thing to sing and to tell stories through song. I wonder um, if, if either of you have any kind of strong or vivid memories of storytelling from, from your childhood. I guess for me, it was like my the first storyteller was like my, either my mum or my dad would really like sit down and they would get the book. And like, it was really like, I think the first one I remember was like Harry Potter when they like, I think my mum read me the first chapter when I was like four or five or something. And she got to the bit just when they're in like the tower in the, in the first one or like the lighthouse and like the door is smacked down and the door falls flat and there's a dark figure in the doorway. And I had nightmares for an entire night until the next day she was like it's Hagrid he's nice yeah he's actually a nice guy yeah yeah it's like, <laughs> why did we stop there and it's like the chapter two is called the keeper of the keys <laughs> it's like why <laughs> but it's still just like it was, I was I was hooked and that's like I, I learned to read really fast just so I could like read more books 
So yeah, yeah I think that's the only one I've got. <laughs> I, I love that. I love, and you find out, yeah, he's actually really nice. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I had a similar experience. I think the first uh, series that uh, I remember being read um, to me by my parents was my dad sat down and read my brother and I, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. And that was, uh, um, you know, just, it's just a great series, but you know, his, his, his sort of reading of that, I think I will never read that book, even though I, I don't read it out loud anymore. I'll never read that book now and not sort of hear, you know, his narration or his idea of kind of what the character sounded like. And actually I, my tattoo is also on my arm here is a, uh, uh, inspired by the voyage of the dawn treader so it's like that's how deeply this kind of stuff sticks with you right those first stories and kind of how you see yourself and yeah yeah for those who are familiar i'm ruby cheap obviously the noble the noble mouse who goes and fights with a sword and thinks he's a pirate that's that's me um but uh but yeah yeah no i think those uh, those focus i think it's important to tell our kids stories uh, and i think it's important to pay attention to the stories that are being told to our kids um uh, i uh, as a you know as a teacher um in kind of part of my another part of my life you know i, I see uh, a lot of the stories that are kind of being told by kids or being heard by kids and um uh, yeah i think we i think we need as adults need, and and sort of as leaders need to sort of guide them through that and and provide them stories worth listening to oh definitely um i i remember my grandfather bought me a copy of The Hobbit. I was maybe about 10 years old or so. Um, and we would have conversations. He would ask me, you know, how I was getting on with the, the book, what I liked about it, and um, which is a fond memory. And, you know, that introduced me to Middle Earth and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And um, it's, it's a world uh, that I, when in my youth, I was very happily lost in. And to this day, um, you know, on occasion, I'm still very happy to lose myself there. <laughs> We're still there. We're right there with you. We're right there with you. So <laughs> you can never escape. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You can never escape. There was, a, there, there was a super, I was, it was recently Hobbit Day or something. And so all this stuff comes up on social media about Lord of the Rings. And there's this great, great post about the review that C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, wrote for The Hobbit when The Hobbit first came out. Um, which is funny. I didn't know he wrote a review, but he wrote a review for his his friend J.R. Tolkien. Of course, they're both part of the Inklings, and they would meet together and share each other's manuscripts. But he said, "I'm not going to get this exactly right." But he said something to the effect of what you just said in terms of like um, uh, the world is nothing that you can anticipate, and once you've read it, you, you, you'll never escape it. It's like it's like you know, you can never guess what's ahead of you, and you'll you'll never be able to leave it behind. It kind of sticks with you. So yeah, yeah, those are the kind of stories that we should be telling. So I actually I remembered a quote from. Uh... Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. How can I forget Tolkien's name? Yes. This isn't going to go well because I can't even remember Tolkien's <laughs> name. But um, <laughs> when I was when I was like writing, I used to have on like the top of my page of notes had a like something written by him, which was like fantasy is escapist, like by its very nature. And um, if we have like a, a prisoner of war, do we not consider it his duty to escape? So as fantasy writers or things, we need to escape and take as many people with oh, us as we can. Oh my goodness, that. that's wonderful. I love that. I'm definitely paraphrasing that horribly. <laughs> <laughs> it's I always. I, I feel the central the theme there. I love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. Absolutely. And um, so, would you both agree then that oral lore and storytelling has had a really important and positive effect on the three of us, for example? Yeah, I would definitely say so. I think like it just it, it takes you away sometimes when you're like maybe your day's not going so well. Like it's always you can always flick on something. Like so for me, if like my mood's down, like maybe I'll listen to music, but I've always got the choice. I can listen to one of my favorite podcasts or I can listen to like one of my favorite audiobooks, and I can just like, right, I'm just going to run away to like this part of the solar system or this kind of thing. And then just like, and it, for me, like as well, it's obviously inspired me to be like, oh, I'm going to, I need to do, I need to do this. Like maybe I could do that. That's, and it's, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's always really been important and it's, it will always. It's, <laughs> I, I I totally agree with Alex, and and, and I was going to add too that like you know I used to I used to really despise listening to radio because there were so many ads and there's all these songs I didn't want to listen to, and then you know they're going on and on about all this terrible news all the time. But but you're right, like it's it's different now, right? Like you can you can listen to an audio book, you know, you can carry you know a hundred stories in your pocket, sort of thing, and, and we have a more choice I think in terms of what we listen to, and we can sort of choose the media that we're exposing ourselves to and, and carrying along with us, and and. Less ads. Oh, I can't stand ads. So there we go. <laughs> and do you often find yourself inspired if you're listening to, say, an audiobook or music or um, a play on the radio or something like that? 
I do. I do. And actually I just got a little audio recorder on my phone and I'll just, I'll, I just, it's just full of all these like little clips of, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll listen back to it and I'm like, Oh man, did I, did I hit my head or something? Was that, I thought that was a good idea. And other times I'm like, Oh, I'm so glad I remembered this. I'd forgotten that I put that down and, and it might turn into a song or it might turn into, you know, a piece of the story too. But um, I, I don't know how you both are, but I'm, I'm just constantly rolling in my head. This, you know, this world of Naros is this sort of, uh, uh, you know, wardrobe, Narnian type wardrobe in the back of my mind that, you know, I can just open up and I've, I've just spent so much time there. It's, it's cool now to sort of invite other people in to share the adventure and, and kind of have, have Alex sort of like touring us through the, the realm now too. So, yeah. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for a wonderful conversation today. And I'm delighted to say we have a clip of the audiobook coming up in just a moment. But before we go, where can the audience find you online and when might they have the joy of listening to The Gatewatch? Well, um, I'll go first. <laughs> go <for it. laughs> um, on, like, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as Alex C. Stewart VA. Uh, that's the only places you can find me. Uh, <laughs> and down at the pub. Uh, well, The Gatewatch. Actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, down the bump. Uh, which, who, all yeah. of them. All of the bumps. <laughs> Those were in central Glasgow. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, that's what it really is, all the pubs, yeah. And uh, the audiobook is going to be coming out on October 5th, and that will be on Audible, so keep uh, an eye out for that. And um, uh, you should also be able to uh, access it through crowsnestbooks.com, which is the publisher of the book, and um, I'll be putting something up on it on my website, too. There's joshuagilliam.ca. I'm on Twitter as well. I, I got off Instagram, though, so you're going to have to, if you're an Instagram person, you're going to have to connect with Alex. Once again, Joshua and Alex, thank you. And do remember, you're welcome to come back again soon. And now, to the Gate Watch. Chapter 1. Ascent The mist on the mountain settled low as the damp morning chill turned to drizzling rain. Three figures made their way through the fog and up a narrow mountain pass on horseback. From under the hood of his dew-drenched, coal-grey cloak, each one watched his white breath swirl and rise before it joined the surrounding mist. One of the dim grey figures coughed violently and yanked his horse to a halt. With frozen fingers he fumbled for a sip of fire meat. Finding his flask empty, he tore it off the strap and hurled it far into the mist. Damn this cold! Damn this fog, said another. He stepped close behind and drew out a flask and tossed it to his companion. And damn these stinking horses! The leading figure, now thirty paces ahead, tugged gently the reins. As his horse turned to face the others, a swirl of fog danced around its ankles. He lifted his hood and squinted. Even from such a short distance they were hardly visible. However, despite the foul weather... He could hear the click of every buckle, clasp, and hoofbeat echo between the flat rock faces. As for the cold and fog, I'm afraid there isn't much I can do about that. However, as far as horses go, you are certainly welcome to walk. The trailing figure gargled the last of the fire maid and gulped it down. And damn you, Torrin Tentries! The other two laughed, and soon all were on their weary way once again. The airy cliffs of Norhaven were far behind them now. The soft rush of wind over the fields around Jarl Einar Tentry's wood-fired hall had long since given way to the towering trees of Stagwood Forest. Then came the river Noros, which cut through the hills, its rushing waters as quick and strong as a rugged stallion. For a few days they had followed the river, often stopping to rest at shanty inns and thatched roof villages. Now it had been two days since they left those rushing waters to start the slow, steady ascent up Shadowstone Pass. Every hour since, the air had grown colder, the rocks rougher, and the trees scarcer. Torin passed both reins to his right hand so that he could draw his cloak together with his left. As he did, a trickle of water rushed down the front of his hood and splashed onto his exposed hand. The back of his cloak had long since soaked through, and now weighed on his shoulders, icy cold and heavy as chainmail. His woven pants stuck to his skin, and both his boots were beginning to fill up with frigid mountain rain. He and his two companions had spent the previous night in a shallow cave at the bottom of Shadowstone Pass. Now he fondly recalled the roar of the fire, the last great chunk of salted pork, and the bitter malted ale. These were all luxuries whose weight they could not afford on the steep ascent. 
In just a few hours, these comforts had come to seem as far off as his father's hall. As the path levelled off, Torrin hoped that they'd reached the crest, and soon it began to climb again, this time much steeper than before, up and up into the mist. The jagged stones grew sharper, and at times the path became so narrow that Torrin's boots would scrape against rocks along the edge. Even the horses, sure-footed as any, started to slip and stumble. The companion who trailed farthest behind now coughed again and then cleared his throat. It is a wonder any survive the journey up Shadowstone Pass to defend Gatewatch. Who would have the strength to fight trolls after this ascent? The second companion laughed. Grimsa, it seems we should have asked your mother to pack along some warm milk and sugar to soothe you. Though, blacken her. Perhaps you could play the part, Torrin. Honestly, Bryn, I don't envy his mother, Torrin said. Nor do I envy his horse. If that steed's spine isn't crooked from his weight, its ears must soon be deaf from his whining. By or and all the gods, Torrin Ten Trees, I'll knock your brains out if we ever make it over these damn mountains. Though wet has long abandoned you, your brawn is never in short supply, Grimsa. I'll give you that, said Bryn. Bryn, you twig-legged, spindly, sparrow-minded twit. Remember that I'll have to bash my way through you to get to Torin on this narrow path. I give you the lass of my fire meat, and this is what I get in return. I suppose to lend to a bear and expect honey in return is a fool's mistake. Thank you for listening today. As always, please feel free to email on mlegendlore at gmail.com, hop on over to Twitter at loremyth, and check out our Facebook and YouTube channel, Myth Legend Lore. Take care for now. I'm Siobhan Clark, and you've been listening to the Myth Legend and Lore podcast. <laughs>